let's do this. I'm told that about 50% of those that are here um, are either somewhere between zero and five years of pastoral ministry. Um, you've both pastored for a long time. So maybe we could start here. Could you tell us your sense of calling to ministry and how it was that the Lord called you to the pastorate? Specifically to the pastorate. So let me give you the stages because it happened in stages. Um, Stage one was the summer of 66, and I was gloriously confident in God that I should be a medical doctor because he had made it plain to me in April of that year that that's what I should do, which is a great lesson in not overstating your subjective sense of God leading. (laughs) So confident as I was, I went to summer school to catch up on chemistry, because I was behind as a lit major. And um, God smacked me down in the hospital at the end of that summer with mononucleosis for three weeks, and I had to drop organic chemistry, and Harold John Ockengay was speaking in the chapel, and I was listening on the radio, and everything in me another wonderful subjective reality, said, I would love to handle the Bible like that. And I had fallen in love with Noel about four weeks earlier, and we were crazy in love and talking marriage already. And she comes to visit me, and and I said, I know you fell in love with a pre-med student, but that ain't going to (laughs) happen. It's, it's, I'm, I really do sense God leading me. So that was stage one, a call to the word. If you had said at that moment, pastor, I would have said never, never. I couldn't speak in front of a group. I, I had no intention or desire to be a pastor, but I loved the Bible and I wanted to preach. I mean, I wanted to, to know it and maybe teach it. Um, go to seminary teach for six years. Now it's October 1979. That was 66. And I've never been a pastor. I've preached maybe 10 sermons in my life, never buried anybody, never married anybody, uh, never visited anybody in the hospital, I don't think, not as a pastor anyway. And about midnight, talk about another subjective experience, uh, like Pascal said, fire. And um, I could not resist the desire to preach. I was writing a book on Romans 9, which is one of the weightiest passages on the might and sovereignty of God in his freedom. And everything in me was saying, and I think it was God saying, I will not just be analyzed I will not just be explained, I will be heralded. And so I waited for my wife to wake up the next morning and dropped another bomb on her (laughs) and said, what would you think if I were to resign my six-year teaching career at Bethel College and look for a church? And she said, I could see that coming (laughs) because because she had heard me make so many comments about sermons either being wonderful or terrible. Uh, And so I went to the denominational official and said, I believe God is calling me to the pastorate and would you help me find a church? And they said, we think you should go to Bethlehem. And that's where I was for 33 years. Praise God. Joel, how about you? Yeah, uh, I was brought into very deep conviction of sin for about 18 months before I found deliverance from the age of 14 to just about when I turned 16. And when God finally delivered me in Christ, good measure through reading the Puritan books in my dad's bookcase, I read the whole bookcase uh, late at night, every night, 
And when I found that freedom, I was so shy, so shy. I never raised my hand in class ever in my whole life. Hated standing in front of the class. But my tongue was unloosed, and I started going to all the neighbors up and down the block. I had to bring them the gospel. And, uh, but ministry, I mean, that never entered my mind at that point because the youngest minister in our denomination, I think, was 52, and I was 16. <laughs> and he just, you know, just old men were ministers, in my mind. And we lived in a very sheltered denomination, very, very, very conservative and no elder, no ruling elder in the church was under 50 years of age. And so that's just out of the question. I mean, didn't even think about it. But I'm working for my dad as a carpenter, and there was a man who was very fussy. My dad had built a house for him, and there was all kinds of weeds growing up in his lawn. He would not put weed killer on it. He said, do you have some low person on the totem pole who could possibly pull all these weeds by hand over a period of one month. So, of course, I was the lowest guy in the totem pole. So I spent a month just pulling weeds. And I'll just tell you like it is. I've, I've given up trying to label it or trying to put fences around it, but this is exactly what happened. I was pulling weeds and not thinking even about God. And I know it wasn't a physical voice, but it sure felt like one. It was very subjective experience to say, go forth and preach the gospel to all the nations. And it was so powerful, I just stood up and my, my hands were shaking. I looked around and there was no one there. And I was just overwhelmed. I, I, I couldn't shake it off. I was just overwhelmed. I went to my pastor who was very wise. He said, well, maybe, maybe that's the beginning of a call, but the Lord will confirm it in other ways. And that's, that's what happened. So about six months later, I was asked to speak to all the young people of the denomination, which was only done by ministers. And I was 16 years old, and I just couldn't understand how I got the invitation, but I was scared stiff. But that was a, a turning point in my life when I spoke on that occasion, because the Lord, I think, gave me some freedom to speak. And then I started getting confirmations from other elders and ministers. Have you ever considered the ministry? And so things began to escalate from there. But from the day that I received those words, go forth and preach the gospel to all the nations, till today, I never doubted, really doubted in the depths of my being for one second that God's hand was in this. And I, I could say, even as a 16-year-old, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. But then it was a long process to get into the ministry in, in that denomination. And, um, but the Lord opened all those doors. And, um, yeah, I, you know, when you've been a minister basically your whole life and your whole heart has been in it, you just can't do anything else. You can't even think about doing anything else. This is all-consuming. Uh, and so I think the call to the ministry varies a lot, and I don't... You know, a lot of men, when they come to our seminary, they think they're called. They're not 100% sure. But they're testing the waters, and that's fine. God calls his servants in many different ways, but that, that's how I was called. And had I not, you need, God is, God is sovereign. Had I not been called in that incredibly, overwhelmingly powerful way, there's no way I ever would have been accepted in that denomination mm. as a minister. That's exactly what they were looking for. But I had no knowledge of all that. It's just that God gave me what I needed to be accepted into the ministry. So you have to be a Dutch reform charismatic in order to be. <laughs> that, that's what they were looking for. You got to read my two chapters of my RST against charismatic. <laughs> It is interesting that both of you were shy, that you didn't want to stand up in front of people, uh, and yet you felt the call of the ministry. Probably young men in this room that say, well, I'm introvert, I'm an introvert, uh, never been comfortable standing in front of people. Was that something that you worked through? Was that something that you grew in? Was that something that you felt like, no, once 
you started heading down the path of ministry, that was just supernaturally provided for? Summer of 66 was, was the most important summer in my life so far. Uh, I not only found a wife that summer, Noel, who's been my wife for 55 years, and I not only heard that call, but I wasn't shy. I was paralyzed. I mean, I don't joke about this at all. I didn't have butterflies. I had paralysis. My, my folks took me to psychologists, and, and nobody believed in psychologists. And Christians believed in psychologists in 1964. Um, I mean, this was mega serious and, and disabling, okay? Uh, so I went off to Wheaton knowing that they required a speech course, knowing that I would save that till the end, that I would drop out of school. <laughs> and I would go to a state school and finish there. That is exactly what I thought because there's no way I would do a speech class. Um, so in the summer of 60, so this is an answer to your question. It, it, I didn't work through it. It was a gift, and, and it came like this. Chaplain Evan Welch comes up to me that summer and says, Johnny, will you pray in chapel? Summer school chapel at Wheaton had about 500 students in it. And out of my mouth came the words, how long do you have to pray? And he said, 30 seconds, a minute? And, and I said, yes. And to this day, I have no idea how that happened. I don't know why I said yes. I walked back and forth on front campus saying, God, I've made, I think, two vows in my life. And this is one of them. I said, if you will get me through 30-second prayer behind that gigantic pulpit in Edmund Chapel, um, I will never say no to you again out of fear to a speaking opportunity and he got me through a dam broke it just broke and as I've looked back on it I, I can't help but think that a wife and a calling together pro produced that under the Holy Spirit I mean this is just a, a, a guess but um, it's worth thinking about to have a woman come into your life when you're a a pimple-faced, insecure, never having dated in your life, wondering if any girl could ever like you, and she likes you? <laughs> right? This is, this is very powerful. So I, I think... I really do believe, and I don't know how all the spiritual pieces fit together, but I think Noel's love for me and God's saying, you're going to study the Bible for the rest of your life, did something together with that opportunity in chapel. So I did take that speech class. I gave that speech on how to lift barbells. <laughs> Because I thought if I, if I moved around enough and, and showed barbells that it would distract people from how nervous I was. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, won the, I won the Clarence Roddy Preaching Prize at Fuller Seminary three years later. Hmm. And I'm on my face um, those days thinking, how did that happen? And to this day, I don't know how it happened. It was just a gift. Yeah. Well, the gospel unloosened my tongue. And so I started speaking to people about the gospel at work, at school, every friend I had, uh, every strangers. And when I was still in regular social situations where there was nothing special, just a social situation, I still felt kind of withdrawn and shy. But the ministry itself got me over that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just a matter of time there. But I was painfully shy. Yeah. So when you think about the pastorate, I think most of us, we have different pastors in our minds that we've served with or served or we've been under or we've watched from afar. 
Um, when you think about, and this is the best pastor I know. Uh, you can give a name, you don't need to. But what is it that, that marks him, the best pastor that you know? You have to go first on this okay. one. Um, a, a passionate love for his people and being there, as that one book was called, being there, um, and, and just caring deeply and, and being very prayerful with your people. Um, I, I was ordained on March 30, 1978, and two days later, a minister came over who is 50 years a minister. So I asked him, what advice would you have to give me? Give me all the advice you have from all those years of ministry. He goes, I'll give you one thing. And if you do that, everything else will fall in place. So I was all ears. And he said, always, always pray with your people. When they, and everything you do, everything you do, if you do it a thousand times in the ministry, pray before everything you do. And that impacted me tremendously. And I think that um, when a minister really prays with his people, when they walk in and they sit down to visit and they pray, he prays before, he prays after, and they feel his love, they feel like he loves their soul more than they do, as I mentioned in my last talk, I think that's a real pastor, one, one who really, really cares. So, and as you grow in ministry, especially long-term ministry, as you know, um, when you're there more than three, five years, when you're 10 or more years, I think leadership magazine used to say 10 years or more is long-term ministry. But when you go a whole generation or the next generation, you, you become like a father to the, whole, to the whole congregation. This is like your extended family. And so I think that's a sign of a really good pastor too. You, you, you become a kind of a father figure where people feel very free to come to you for, for anything. Tell you secrets that they've told nobody else and they know you hold it confidential. And you're just a real pastor to them. Yeah, I don't like questions that ask for the best anything, except God, Bible, Christ, gospel. Those are all the best, but but because I'm fallible, I just don't know. Okay, so I reject the, you know. I reject the question. <laughs> and and I'll take it. And I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to change the question turn. because okay. I think I can answer what you are asking without claiming to know what's best. Um, I'm going to say, this is getting very complicated, what, what, past, yeah, I'm, what, I'm confused. what pastor uh, right now alive, because I, I really like dead pastors better than live yes. pastors, <laughs> what, what pastor alive has a significant influence on me? And I'm going to say Mark Dever, and I'm going to tell you why. Number one, um, solid as a rock theologically. Number two... He um, loves the church, and I'm convicted because yes. I don't think I love the church as much as Mark does. Took, takes membership really seriously. I don't think I took membership seriously enough. And, and then two things that are most significant, and that's like best significant. Um, Good. Thick-skinned and happy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've never met anybody... I'm looking in the camera now, so Mark's going to watch this. I've never met anybody like you who, no matter what happens, he seems to be able to ride the, the wave of, of criticism and stay happy without being a stoic. So thank you. I wish I were more like that. I tend to get angry. And um, then the, the last thing is evangelism. I get around... I mean, the first time I ever met Mark, he took me up on top of his church. This is 15, 20 years ago. And he just walked around the rim of the top of his church, pointing out the unbelievers' homes where, where he was working on people. So I'm, I, for those four reasons at least, like hanging out with Mark Dever. It mainly makes me feel guilty. Um, <laughs> But that's good for me. You don't want to just hang out with people that make you feel affirmed. You need to feel convicted. Yes. Yeah, Mark, Mark does, he's got that thick skin. He can be very clear in what he says, and he does it with a smile. I remember last time we had him at URC, I was standing next to him at our church, 
Baptist member of our congregation came up to him and said, I'm in this PCA church, Presbyterian church. I don't believe what they do about baptism. What should I do? He said, leave and find a Baptist church. He said it with a smile <laughs> right while I was standing next to him. So we may have different appreciations of Mark, but I do appreciate some of the same things about him. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, Starting out in ministry, what were some of the things that you were too concerned about when you first started out in ministry? And these are things that took decades for you to figure out that you needed to be more concerned about as you pastored mm. your congregations. Mm. 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 Trying to go first. <laughs> um. Well, let me give just really one concrete example because I think it'll be helpful to, to people who may struggle. Um, I don't think I understood for about 30 years that Jesus' radical command to gouge your eye out because of lust and Paul's command to work out your salvation with fear and trembling should apply with equal violence to non-sexual sins. So I, I learned early on that as a young man, lust in, in, in your head and in your body and, and the temptations to act it out in pornography or worse, um, had to be killed the way Jesus said so. He just said, if, if your eye caused you to sin, tear it out. I mean, that's crazy radical. Use a screwdriver, and your eyeball comes out. I mean, that's crazy language, right? That's about as violent as you can get. So go after lust that way. Now, I got that as a young man, and I think I did it. I've never committed fornication. I've never cheated on my wife. I fight any temptation to look at anything inappropriate, and I fight with violence. Now, that, that was a given, and I hope it's a given in this room. That's what he said. Do that. Better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two eyes, and you're going to go to hell if you give in to lust. That's what he said. Why? Why did it take me until 2010, give or take, to learn you can do the same with self-pity, John Piper? You can do the same with anger. You can do the same with sullenness. So I feel, I've got these, these habitual sins ruining my marriage for, for years, making life hard for me, for her. And I had this passive notion about sanctification with regard to that kind of sin. Like the only way you fight that kind of sin is by getting happy in Jesus and the expulsive power of a new affection pushes it out. It wasn't working. Whereas the Bible says that, by all means that, and then it says kill it. Kill it. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Take the same screwdriver to your self-pity. So, for some reason, in 2010, I, I thought, work out your salvation with fear and trembling doesn't just apply to lust. Fear and trembling applies to you walk in the house, your wife and daughter are having a really happy time looking at some girl show on, on the computer. <laughs> and you came home, you came home expecting to be welcomed <laughs> and treated with some acknowledgement that I'm here <laughs> and, and having a pleasant evening together and they barely look up. Guys, this, this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of ego 
and sin. And so I, I know the sequence of sins that follow at that moment. Self-pity, anger, withdrawal, sullenness, and everything goes bad in the family. That's my problem. That's not their problem. That's my problem. So, I walk in, it happens, and I see it coming. Like, it's like lust. You see it coming. And, and you take hold of the sword of the Spirit, and you say, you're not going to win this one. And I smile. Now, you might think, that's fake. Well, it was a little bit. <laughs> I smile. I greet them like everything's just fine, even though you're, you're paying no attention to me at all. And I go upstairs, and I get down on my knees, and I fight like hell to kill that sin. Actually, like heaven to kill that sin. <laughs> I, I fight until it's dead. It's dead. And I can go downstairs a new man, loving my family, not feeling self-pity. So it took me a long time. Now, that, that's not just pastoring, but it really messed me up, I think, a lot. And I, I hope that I am, am a more, I hope I'm a better husband, a better father um, in the last 14 years or so than I, than I was before. That's one example of something that took me a long time to learn. Yeah, my response is not going to be that dramatic, but it was good. It was, good. <laughs> it was very, very good what you said. Um, I, I think that when you're really a young minister and you're with a lot of older ministers and you're being watched and examined and you're feeling pressed into a certain mold and I think I was too concerned about myself and how I did and it was um, yeah it was a, a huge relief to really break out of that and be more concerned about God's glory it's not how well I preached but it's what has the Lord done with that sermon in so-and-so's life. And I've come to a greater appreciation over the years with the, um, the complexity of what God uses for the conversion of someone and their growth in grace. So I'm just happy now to be just a little, have a little place in that back of the watch, as I was talking about. Um, maybe it's this sermon. Maybe it's that book I wrote. Maybe it's that conference I was at. It just had a little place to play in someone's spiritual growth. And I'm just very content with that. That you're losing, as you get older, you lose that sense of, of jealousy of others. And you, you just feel more comfortable, I think, in your own skin to be who God wants you to be. And, and, and use the gifts that God has given you and not worry about the gifts of someone else. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was first married to Mary, I was, I'm, I'm a very close friend of Sinclair Ferguson, and, you know, he told me one time we were sitting down, he had a book to write in two, two weeks. I said, two weeks? Weeks? He said, weeks. It was due to Zondervan. I said, well, how are you going to do it? He goes, well, I'll write one chapter a night, and I, it doesn't work for me to go over what I've written, so I just write one draft, and then I send it off. I said, 14 chapters you're going to write in two weeks? He said, Yeah. So I came home to my wife and I said, wow, can you imagine if I was Sinclair Ferguson, how many books I could write? <laughs> and she goes, honey, I think you better be content with the gifts God has given you. <laughs> but she was so right. And she said it so sweetly and mildly, you know, just be content. You, you pastors, be content in your own skin. Don't try to use gifts God hasn't given you. But do cultivate the gifts he has given you to the max. And then just, just be God-centered and try to focus on his glory and the salvation of souls and their growth in grace. And really, I've got a little sign in my bathroom that says this. A minister's real wages are when he sees his people coming closer to Christ. And, and that gives me more satisfaction than any paycheck or anything else. If I see someone growing in grace... 
Oh, it's so satisfying. So be more concerned about God's glory, the welfare of souls, less concerned about yourself. Just be faithful and do what you, do what you can do. That's really good. And it's one of the things I appreciate most about both of you is I feel like you use your gifts where the Lord has placed you. Uh, you do so for the benefit of the body, the greater body, your local church, you're committed to it. Um, one of the things I've watched about both of you is that you're willing to contend for the faith when it's necessary uh, in ways that are public when it's being assaulted, uh, and yet you're not contentious for the faith. Um, we live in a day where we're trying to, people are trying to wrestle through that, and especially pastors are more and more put in positions like that. Um, John, think about you and uh, think about when you, well, complementarianism. You felt like that was something that had to be contended for in our day, or uh, the new perspective on Paul, uh, or Joel, think about you with the assurance of salvation in your own context in the, the Dutch church. Um, seeing how that was affecting uh, people in the Dutch Reformed world and contending for a right view. How have you decided what the talents that you've been given, the gifts you've been given, when it is that you are to speak to something, contend for it in that kind of way, and times that you've decided, ah, no, this is not, I'm not going into that battle. So I think some always are fighting, some are never willing to fight. Mm. Um, mm. If everyone loves you, there's a problem. If everyone hates you, you're a problem. Uh, <laughs> seems like you guys have done this well. How have you decided what to contend for and what not to? As I've looked at the things that I've, I've contended for, you mentioned two of them, complementarianism, justification, Sovereignty of God, Reformed Theology, Calvinism, five points, um, several others. It seems like, I mean, I, I, I don't think I, I, I operate from a set of principles on that, but when I step back and look, there were principles at work. To what degree is the Scripture being undermined, the authority of Scripture? To what degree is the Gospel being compromised? To what degree is the nature of God being minimized, called into question? Uh, and to what degree is the uh, imago dei? Mm -hmm. And I say that because I'm a real hater of abortion, mm -hmm. right? I will stand in front of Planned Parenthood in three weeks and lead in prayer. Um, I hate killing children in the womb. I think it's wicked. And, uh, and I say, why? Why, why? why do I feel so urgent about that? And uh, I think it's because God is the one who is knitting us together in our mother's womb. This is his business to make images of himself like that. We better not intrude upon that. That's really evil. So those are four categories, scripture, God, gospel, Imago Dei, image of God in man. To, to what degree is a false teaching starting to spread that is making those doctrines obscure, that is upsetting or ruining? And then I, I think some of it is just subjective, what you love, you know. I love the sovereignty of God. I, I became a Calvinist late. That is, I didn't grow up with it. I would date my conversion to Calvinism in the fall of 68. Um, so I'm 22 uh, years old. Guys came to Fuller Seminary. These were, these were pretty good days at Fuller. Guys came from reformed schools. I won't name any, but... And they were tired of Calvinism. They'd had it running out of their ears since they were six. And I'm leaping for joy at the sovereignty of God in my salvation as I see it in the Bible. And to, that, to this day, I've never stopped leaping. I love sovereign grace. So I would 
I would go to the mat for that over and over again. I've, I've want, I want to be a part of movements, and I want to be a part of conferences that I want to be part of a school, part of a ministry that highlights the, the absolute sovereignty of God's grace and salvation. So I think what you love is a, is a big piece of it. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with that answer. What, what you love, what you feel really passionate about and you feel the Lord has laid on your heart will kind of shape your, shape your ministry. You, want, you will preach the whole counsel of God if you're a faithful minister and you're exegeting through Bible books and you'll, you'll do it with love and passion. But there are certain things that stand out, especially with the passing of the years. You mentioned assurance of faith. I feel the same way about Reformed experiential preaching. When I was in an Eastern European country, I was, uh, I was assaulted, and I was tied, my hands behind my back, tied around my ankles, and they put a rag in my mouth and tied me around my, my eyes, and um, I was on the ground, they were running a knife up and down my back, and they were shouting out that they were the mafia, and they just told me all day long that if you're ever in the hands of the mafia, you're a dead man, so I thought I was going to die. And um, well, finds out in the end that they really weren't the mafia, and they took the keys out of my pocket, went to the seminary where I was teaching, stripped the seminary of all the computers, sold them on the black market, and left me alone. And I finally worked myself free. And, um, but when I actually lived, I didn't even pray for myself during those 45 minutes because I was sure I was dying. I was just praying for my wife and ministries and kids. And I had a light bulb moment um, when I sat up and actually was alive. And I just said, Lord, I vow that I will spend every moment of my waking life from here on in to, to do what I was already doing, but I would do it more intensely, to, to promote reformed experiential preaching and teaching all around the world. And that's why I train men from all around the world. That's why I, everything in my ministry, in my book ministry, in my, everything is channeled in that, in that passion, much like you have the passion about, you know, delighting in God and God getting his most glory. I mean, it comes through in all your writings. So this comes through in all my writings and all my commitment. Uh, I want people to understand what it means. And I, I, I think the joy of the Christian life becomes so much greater when you really experience the doctrines of grace and not just have it in your head. So my focus is there, so I'm not really an apologetics guy, defending this, defending that all the time, but when push comes to shove, like abortion is one thing I feel very strongly about, preach very strongly about, against. Um, but I think you need, you need to find your, your right balance for you as a minister, what God is calling you to. Family worship is another big thing for me. I've preached on it in 50 different countries around the world. I just feel so strongly that we've got to get back to the old family worship style where dads are speaking to their children every day as they did in Reformation and Puritan times uh, about the truths of God. So those things, if you, if you call that apologetics in a way, yeah, I'm big on that, but I, I just don't think it's my business nor my gift to get involved, for example, in other seminaries' intramural debates, Right? This seminary is pitting this against this seminary, and people come up to me and say, well, as a seminary president, what do you think of that? Uh, I'm not going to enter into that. I'm going to stay above that fray, unless it's a really, like you said, a really heretical doctrine. And I'm going to put my energy, for the most part, into, into positive things, promoting positive things, especially where the church is not realizing its calling. I will speak out strongly against worldliness in churches, because I think that's a huge problem. Um, but when I have to preach a really warning sermon against a particular sin, um, I do it because I feel compelled to do it, and I think I do it with all my heart. But afterwards, I am just completely wiped out. I mean, I'm just like washed up. <laughs> so I think you each have to find your own way as pastors and know yourself, but also be faithful to God and what he's calling you to do. I, I want to just underline that uh, in in your pulpit over time, you shouldn't want to be known as this pulpit is about controversy. This pulpit is about 
Christ, this pulpit is about salvation, this pulpit is about joy, this pulpit is about heaven, this pulpit is about holiness, and the, the robust sense of walking in hungry and walking out fed with the glories of the gospel and the glories of Christ can happen with sprinkled controversies. You do need to say things about horrible things in the culture, but you don't need for that to be the, uh, the symphonic theme so that people say, oh, that's the church where they're always fighting somebody. Um, but rather, that's the perch where they seem to be really happy in God, where they seem to love the glory of God, but they know where you stand on just about everything. I, th I think it's a mistake when churches and pastors are not, it's not clear where they stand on homosexuality, on transgender, on abortion, on all kinds of things that come along in the culture. They'll, they'll change over time. But if you don't, if it's not plain, then what's going to happen is people are going to just start coming to church and they won't know what you believe. And that will breed a lukewarm church in the long run that's wishy-washy in its stands and its doctrines. But you, in order to accomplish that, you really don't have to harp on those things. You don't. You can harp on God. And then people will feel, okay, this church is mainly about Christ and his greatness, about the gospel and its greatness, about God and his greatness, about mission and its greatness. And I know exactly where they stand on biblical issues. That's really helpful. So let's continue along that line of thought. You both have pastored same church for decades um, and have, by all accounting, uh, as we can this side of heaven, it's, it remained effective for all of those decades. Uh, no doubt there are ups and downs, uh, so are in any church. But it's odd it's odd for a pastor in our day and age to remain in a church for 30 plus, 40 plus years. Um, what else would be an encouragement to us to have, if there are men in this room say, more of you need to be aimed at that, having a long ministry in the same place? And if so, what, what, what are some ways that it helps to maintain having an effective ministry in the same place for a long time? I've actually got a, about a 150-page paper book, paperback book right now that's 95% done, and it's called Persevering in Ministry. And two chapters are on the subject of maintaining long-term ministry. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's, there's just so many things to say on this. But I think one thing I, I, I want to get out to you men is that when you first come into trouble... Now, there's an old Dutch saying that the first year is a honeymoon year. Years two and three, people actually start to hear what you're saying. Years four through five, or maybe six, are the years where you have a lot of kickback and trials, exactly when many ministers jump ship and go to another church. But what you want to do is you want to stay the course. You don't want to be a hireling that flees the sheep at that point. You want to stay the course beyond that. And you get to year seven, eight, nine... And the people that are really opposed to your ministry, I mean, really a thorn in your flesh, um, they'll leave at that point because they'll say, this guy's never going anywhere, so we're going. <laughs> I, I, don't get me wrong. I always hate to see my sheep leave. But sometimes when you're in long-term ministry, you're 10 and forward, you know, yeah, you have a little skirmish now and then, but there's a stability in the church. And you, you've been there, and you've been feeding them, and the vast bulk of the people, 95% or more now, are full harmony with what you're teaching, and you're not going anywhere. This, these are the most fruitful years where you're, where you're training their children and their grandchildren, and uh, there's just a beauty about long-term ministry that, like I said, it's that father figure in the congregation, and you just walk in church. I, you know... When we sing this altar before I start preaching, I often just kind of look around and say, oh, there's that man I helped 22 years ago uh, when his marriage was in trouble. And oh, there's, there's that woman right now who's got secret problems with her husband, and I've been working with them. There's that young person who I worked with in getting off of pornography. And I just let all these needs and all these experiences just flow over me as I begin to preach. 
And then I, it's like I'm preaching to my own family. And that's so different from preaching at a conference or preaching um, in a church you've only been in two, three years. So I think there's huge advantages in long-term ministry, provided you stay fresh and you keep studying and you keep bringing new things and old from the pulpit. If you just lean on the old barrel of sermons, of course, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's going to run dry and uh, you, you're, you're going to flounder. But if you can stay fresh, long-term ministry is, all things being equal, is God's normal way, I think, of, uh, of, of building up a flock. God wrote a book. God wrote a book. Do, do any of you believe that? I mean, it's just, if that's true, if the creator of the universe who upholds everything by the word of his power and is taking this whole history to a conclusion where you'll either be infinitely happy with him forever or you'll suffer forever, and he tells us all about that in here. This is inexhaustible. So staying fresh is right here. Feeding your soul, so that those, maybe just those two things, like this, believing this book and opening it to your people week in and week out means that you have something glorious to say Every week. I have never walked into the pulpit not excited about what I have to say, including tomorrow night. So we've got a book. Number two, feed yourself on this book. It's what you were talking about earlier. You must stay alive. You must stay alive. The number one task is to get up and get happy in Jesus every morning. That's George Mueller. Get up and get happy in Jesus every morning because your people need your happiness in, in Jesus. And the last thing I would say, because numbers are red down here. Um, <laughs> the, the last thing to say is, once you've given 10 years to a church and you finally persuaded most of the leaders about Reformed theology, and you finally, in a Baptist church, created something called elders, <laughs> and, and you've, 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 you've built something amazing, and somebody invites you to a church like 10,000 people bigger, you say, I wouldn't want to start this over again. <laughs> you kidding me? This has been hard work for 10 years, and we're here. We're here. Now we can finally do something together. So... Yeah, that's, that's the third thing. But it's also true that when you have a built up a relationship for many years and you really love your people, when you get a call from another church, bottom line, you pray about it, but you just say, I can't leave these people. I, there's too much invested. There's too much love here. I just can't leave them. How can I leave all these different people I've helped pastorally and preached to for all these years, and I see them growing? I just can't leave so the old Dutch style was when you accept a call to another church, you've got to know a loosening from your present church and a bonding to the other church. And um, when you're in a church a long time, loosening from that church is very, very difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying God won't call you to another church. But then you have to know that loosening. You don't just say, oh, well, I've been here a number of years, and, you know, the weather's better over there. I'm going to be a little closer to my kids, so I'm going to go there. No, no, you've got to have a, a divine sense of calling to leave a church that you've shepherded so long. Incredibly helpful. A lot of wisdom has been shared this afternoon. Appreciate it. Appreciate your ministries. Uh, John, can I ask you to close us in prayer before you do? Uh, so we're going to break uh, after this, and we will break until 7 o'clock, and then come back at 7 o'clock for worship this evening. Father, if we have said anything amiss or out of balance with your precious word, I pray that you would correct it, cancel it, and if there has been truth, grant it to be embraced and to bear good fruit in the lives of these brothers and sisters. We commend ourselves to your grace now, which is able to establish us and give us an inheritance with all those who are sanctified by faith in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.